What's up, guys? So this is David A.K. Reverse Long, and I got Maj Swade on on the podcast today. Maj is the CEO of Geo Investing, and I had Maj on the podcast uh, maybe around six months ago or so. I don't know. It was late last year. Um, it was a good podcast, you know. So Maj is uh, is is known for like uh, investing strategies in small in small caps and and OTCs and things like that. So yeah, Maj um, has made a name for himself in that niche, and it's it's cool to get connected with Maj. I, I met Maj through a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours in Puerto Rico, and um, yeah, that's where Maj is right now, actually, Puerto Rico. So yeah, uh, with that being said, what's up, Maj? How's it going? Uh, well, fa- thanks, Dave, for doing this. I'm glad to be back here. Um, things are well. Uh, navigating this interesting market for the last what, year and a half now or so. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's been an interesting journey in, in nanocap land, especially OTC land. Yeah, it's been quite a roller coaster, right? Huh? So, you know, since like the pandemic, everything shot up and then everything like flushed out. And then now we're in this like uh, no man's land uh, figuring out or... From my from what my take, I don't know. Maybe you can you can correct me if I'm wrong. Now it's like a no man's land trying to figure out like where we are. Are we like pre pandemic levels? Are we post pandemic? Are we in a new era? Bear market, bull market. I mean, bear market. You know. So I don't yeah. know. What do you, what are your thoughts on that overall? Yeah, I, I can imagine it's, it's tough for traders and investors right now. And it's like I, don't, I think everyone's trying to figure out you know how to how to play. I mean, the last fifteen years got us used to a certain you know, uh, certain successes, right? And, and things came easier, of course. Now it's, it's a lot harder, I think, to uh, maybe achieve some of those goals. And I think that, you know, from my perspective, uh, I'm not really a, much of a day trader. You know, I'll do some trading around my positions once around around earnings time, for example, and look for certain, like, you know, catalyst setups and stuff like that. But I can, so I can't speak too much to, like, how the trading environment's changed that much, right? But I, I can imagine it's, it's certainly, it, it's, it's certainly been challenged. At least traders I've talked to, um, but um, you know, from from like an investing point of view, like long, you know, like long term investing or investing in companies, <clears throat> that's you know, that, that environment has changed a little bit. And uh, I talk about it a lot, where you know the environment kind of used to be where, um, I, I, you know, I hate to use the word value investing because you know if you if you if you invest in stocks and you want to hold and you and you are a long term investor, you're obviously hoping that's undervalued. And then you, you want to rise in value over time, mm-hmm. but kind of like the the, the the bar has risen now in terms of what type of stocks I think the market's going to uh, um, basically gravitate towards in terms of you know success. You know, so we we saw what happened, right? We saw the in December of twenty, you know, November of twenty one ish. You know, we we saw the started seeing the crack in the market a little bit, and of course we all know inflation, and now we now we have rates going up. But you saw this, you know, situation where all these all these companies with were growing revenues really nicely uh, in, a, in a low rate environment, an easy money environment. Maybe weren't making a lot of money, um, and you had um, the, um, the, they were trading at crazy valuation ratios, whether it was PE, maybe no PE at all because they weren't making money, or you know high price to sales ratios, right? So. Um, and we a lot of you know it's easy to get comfortable with that. I, I remember it's you know, if you're looking at a company like you, you'll, you'll see analysts do this a lot of times during these kind of crazy bull runs. They'll start saying, "All right, well, Ring Central is selling at uh, you know only 15 times revenue. It should be 20 times revenue, <laughs> which is a crazy number." Yeah, you know? and uh, everybody accepts it until it's, until it breaks. And now Ring Central is I think under three times revenue, maybe around four or something. Um, I know. I think it was low as two not too long ago. So you know, you, you basically evaluate evaluation has that reversion to mean situation. And what we saw here was the the um, going into a risk, riskier environment. You know, had a reversion to mean evaluation. So all these big these, these larger cap companies or tech companies that did really well during our last bull run. You know, a lot of them just obviously got nipped. Um, and then in the nano cap side, you had you know a lot of these riskier companies, whether it was biotech or you know penny stocks or Again, high revenue companies with blown up capital structures because they could, you know, they could raise money whenever they wanted to raise money, right? And that, and, but, and uh, the market didn't care that they had to raise money. Well, now, now it's not easy to raise money right now. It's harder, uh, especially if you, have any, if you have debt in your balance sheet. So all those really speculative stocks, they got crushed too, and just brought everything down with it, right? <clears throat> so that was that that easy kind of environment kind of changed a little bit. 
to them where it's like, well, the stuff that ironically wasn't working, at least from my observation, that first 15 years, the last 15 years since the 08 recession, um, it didn't seem like you, you had a um, s- small cap value, if you want to call it value, right? Uh, again, I hate doing that, but the, more of a, um, maybe less growth in revenue, but you know, more, more, those may be more emphasis on growing you know, in earnings, whatever. They didn't, they weren't as popular in a broad sense. I mean, obviously you can make money buying their own great companies, right? Uh, that are undervalued, but they weren't getting the multiple expansion you wanted a lot of times. Uh, and the sexier companies like the Teslas of the world and, um, you know, the EV stocks and, all, you know, that the, they had the SPACs and the, that the real speculative sexy stories were going up. So those companies didn't really do as well in a broad sense, especially in nanocap land. <clears throat> um, so now I think, you know, the, I think the pendulum is a little swinging here now. And it's, it's, I don't think it's a, it's an incredible observation. I mean, it makes sense when we're going to a riskier environment now that valuation matters and the health uh, balance sheets matter. And, you know, what, what you make matters. Um, speculative companies aren't going to be able to go out there and raise money like they used to be able to raise them at, at favorable prices. Um, and the market's going to figure that out and send these stock, send these stocks lower probably. Um, so I think the next bull market, which I think is forming, is going to be this traditional boring kind of, you know, I call it, we call it growth plus value or GARP, growth and reasonable price. Your stock are growing, reasonably growing, and have, you know, good value, fair value, you know, reasonable valuations. And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the um, expansion and valuation ratios, really clean, all boring value companies. Um, and I'm excited about that. And there's one area where we're kind of focusing on a lot. We call it the a geo, uh, the big cap, micro cap theme. And these are stocks that are relatively, you know, substantial revenue, uh, maybe big cap revenue, maybe, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but selling at micro cap value, uh, micro cap valuation. And we think like that's the sweet spot of where a lot of the investors are going to want to put their money in that nano cap area. They preserved as, you know, they, they can be perceived as less riskier than a nano cap with maybe 20 million or 10 million of revenue. Um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll attract some institutional investment into those. And I think that's really a, a sweet spot of where I'm going to be put, putting a lot of my own capital uh, and, and, and GEO's kind of um, focus is going to be a lot in that, and less on the speculative side. Um, I mean, we had a great run. That, 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 that first 15 bull year market was just crazy for us. And of course, we got stuck with some of those old stocks that, that, were, that, that maybe had great revenue, but maybe not the best earnings per share thing. So we have to wait for those that earnings to catch up to the valuation at some point, right? And we'll wait for those. But now it's like you know, you, you, you know, we're we're really hyper focused on quality growth stories or quality value plus growth stories. And I think that's the next bull market. And you're starting to see it. Um, you're starting to see like on a new high list. Um, I track new highs. I'm a big, big, I'm a big fan of momentum. Track momentum. It's the one technical thing I track. And you know, you're starting to see like more of those type of stocks on the high list. As opposed to the last 15 years, it was all these crazy stocks, biotechs only, and you know, and, and sexy stories and highs. Now you're starting to see these really traditional boring stocks come in uh, and, and start occupying the high list a little bit. Um, so that's I'm really excited about it. You know, unfortunately, it's painful going through the transition of it because you know the, the tough thing from an investor, you or even a trader situation, if you hold overnight and if you end up in a losing position, like what do you do? You know, it's like you, you, psychologically, do you stick with it? Even though you know it's probably going to be going to come around in a few quarters or maybe you know so, or do you or do you just dump it and buy the new stocks that you think are are better suited for this environment before right, and that's a tough transition. So uh, that's 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 been emotionally tough to sometimes you know go through that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I see things, you know, David, in terms of you know, looking at things. Doesn't mean we won't take like speculative bets. I don't mind doing that and around really specific type of catalyst events. So um, so that's basically my investment theme. So you guys are what kind of stuff I'm gonna, am I putting my portfolio to hold for some period of time on uh, the, the longer term, mid, mid to longer term theme, that's that's where I'm at in terms of the kind of stocks I'm buying. Gotcha, and has um, has geo investing, like how much of that ha- has stayed the same? Is that like, are those uh, strategies or what you're looking for criteria stayed the same as, as as uh, as far as now compared to before, because geo investing, from what you meant, from what I gather, it's it's around fifteen years old. 
or something like that. So how, how did yeah. Geo Investing come? You want to give a little background also maybe on Geo Investing for those who are new to the podcast? Sure, yeah. Yeah, we, so we founded Geo, I think, in 2007 was the official founding. I think maybe we launched the actual site and it went live like maybe in 08. It was first a free site. Um, I've been a full-time investor for over 30 years now. I was investing, you know, right probably before college and early learning about it. I started investing during college. Um, and, you know, I just really quickly out of the gate, I, I, I graduated from, you know, uh, college and worked at Vanguard from 1992 to 94. Um, and then, um, I, I went officially full time, even though I was making more money out trading than I was at my job, uh, uh, full time in, in February '94, um, and just did that for years. And then uh, that's all I was doing trading, um, uh, um, uh, um, these stocks, these nano cap land, bought some real estate along the way, and then decided in 2007 eight to, to launch Geo. And it, we launched it first as a free site to kind of bring this kind of smaller cap research to to, to a public forum. Um, and then I think around 14, 2014, we decided to, you know, make it more of a premium site uh, to control a lot of the the, the, um, the kind of the people that were kind of visiting our site and joining our site. Between like 2000 and maybe, uh, you know, 9 and 14, and, and this is like after, shortly after we launched you, actually, you know, we were along a lot of Chinese, U.S. list of China companies, excuse me. And we actually were, were big short sellers for a while, too. For a significant period of time between that time frame, shorting you uh, China stocks because I had a, we had an on the ground team in China that was up wow. trying to find these companies. Um, there's a, a documentary um, called The China Hustle, which my partner uh, of Geo um, is not with you anymore. He has his own uh, firm called Wolfpack Research, short selling okay. firm. That's Dan yeah. David. And um, but um, you know we were together finding these frauds. Uh, and then we expanded it to maybe looking for pump and dump stocks, just U.S. pump and dump stocks. We, we uncovered about 22 of those. So all tall, we uncovered like some pretty deep dive reports on 14 U.S. less China companies on the short side and about 22 U.S. pump and dumps. So it was it was a it was a cool part of our, our evolution because it's something <laughs> that I never, never had done, you know, shorting stocks. I mean, I was critical of stocks, but I never really shorted them. And it kind of gave us another kind of you know, uh, another kind of notch in our, in, in our research kind of bucket to go, we should we're learning things on this from the shorting and risk analysis that we can kind of apply to, um, you know, when you, when we go long stuff too. Um, so today we have, you know, so if you're a, our members of Geo Investing, for example, you know, you get a morning email from us in the mornings. Um, we have a premium Twitter feed where we talk about our alerts and what's going on in Geo, our research pipeline. We do a live uh, fireside chats with management teams that we um, uh, bring on um, to show you our, our interview process. Uh, we have a Sunday weekly wrap up email, which wraps up the whole week for you, um, and just a lot of you know a lot of great research and content, um, and uh, for for our members, model portfolios, and these kind of things. Um, so that's that's Geo, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also I've launched another venture, um, which I haven't really announced yet, but it's called NS Microcaps. There's no like you know website yet for it, but it's going to be a tool based um, uh, um, platform for the smaller cap investor and we're kind of in phase one of that right now man awesome so yeah i know i know on your website you guys mentioned the the china hustle and you're interested in, in fundamentals of stocks if, you know people don't get shafted like the they did with investing in chinese stocks um i didn't know that you were you were uh you and wolfpack used to have uh something going on on the short side of these during that time because uh yeah the china also i've watched it a few times i, I like that movie um, and in Dubai, I met, uh, what's his name? Son, uh, the, the son, the, um, the guy, the research guy that, uh, spent time in Chinese prison, you know? Oh, oh, uh, not John. Um, John Carnes. He worked with, with John. Yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah. So, he met, um, uh, yeah. son, I think his name is, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll think about it. In a second. It was it was a uh, it was it was last year, early last year. I went to Dubai right. and I met him and we hung out and stuff. Man, what a what a fascinating story! So like to meet him, and he was like one of the stars in the show, right? And the right. documentary. Yeah, this guy spent time in Chinese prison. He went to investigate. You guys, you guys said you guys had boots on the ground over there. Those guys got some 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 heavy, uh, you know, some cojones because uh, <laughs> because <laughs> <Right>. China because <laughs> they, they can be put in Chinese prison. Um. 
Yeah, but but uh, but yeah. Okay, so when you so as you're far talking, as you're talking, you're talking uh, Kuhn, right? Kun, Kun, yeah, 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 yeah. Kun. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, awesome guy, man. Uh, Kun Kun's cool. Hope to meet him again soon when I go back to Dubai for a bit. But um, but yeah, so those Chinese stocks. So you were shorting back then because okay, so my question is, so I, I short a lot of Chinese stocks now, but you got to be extra careful because they they send these things on violent squeezes. They do. Uh, and, and they're like based out of Cayman Islands now. There's like it's morphed a little bit. Oh, and then they got like these WhatsApp. Uh, I don't know if you ever got it. It's like the Tinder swindler. You've seen that documentary? Uh, yes, yeah, I, I, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I've seen it on my Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like they do a version of that. They do like the I call it the Chinese stock swindler. So you get like a, a mass a, a random message on WhatsApp with like a a cute Asian girl as the as the icon or whatever, the profile picture. And then he's like, Oh, I have an uncle to, he wants me to, he wants, you know, you should invest in my uncle's company. This is after establishing rapport, you wow. know, for, and then, and then some people are gullible, you know, I mean, people are gullible, you know, like these days you got this only fan stuff happening and people sign up for these websites and stuff. So they have that going on, but with the stocks. So, so then they'll, they'll pump these Cayman Island stocks up on like, uh, on, on, volume from suckers and also probably wash trading and who knows what and they dump it crazy however the float is so small and so so you know so taken up by these 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 chinese people that it, they they can just squeeze the hell out of them so back then um how did you guys approach the shorts that's yeah, well, you know my when question we, when we first started doing it i wasn't even um i'll tell you we got lucky i'll tell you because the games evolved a lot now where the, where, the, where the regulators let the market take care of a lot of it now. They don't step in as like they used to. Um, if the regulators were this, um, acting the same way they were today, we would have lost a lot of money <laughs> in the beginning. Uh -huh. So it, it was, so, so, but when we first started doing it, we didn't want to, really want to go short. Our, you know, our model at the time was run geo as a research firm. And hopefully we could contract with investment banks, IR firms, legal firms, to let them know if the stocks they were bringing here were fraudulent, you know, and we and, and avoid bringing them here and exporting them here. Um, unfortunately, when these firms realize that, well, it's maybe ninety percent of companies here are frauds, <laughs> we'll have no business. So sorry, we can't work with you. <laughs> we're still going to bring them here. So we had to, we had to, we just in order to you know to basically fund the organization and the research, we had to basically start you know participating in the short side of things. Which I didn't particularly love, and you know, I think we did pretty good with it and make some money. But because I wasn't very aware of how short selling worked and everything, I never got um, aggressive enough to get crazy, crazy with it. And it wasn't in my blood too. I mean, I just, just shorting is really tough for me. Um, you know, Adam. You know, he's I just Adam. You know, you know Adam. You know, bear, you know. Um, yeah, he's, yeah. He loves shorting. He's, he's, <laughs> shorting. he's, he's got yeah. like balls of steel in his. <laughs> like, yeah. When we're talking. And how does he do it? And uh, but he does well with it. So you have to have that. It's 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 how I feel about going along, right? And um, but yeah. So when we, but we eventually did go short. Yeah, you know, I you know at that time we you know we would just we we were basically confident in the way it would work. So we would find a company that was fraudulent, um, and eventually we'd just go to zero, and and, and regulators had to step in. Now at that time these stocks were like a hundred percent frauds. It was so easy to prove. Um, there were a lot of brick and mortar companies in China. You can go and uh, investigate them on the ground. It's a lot harder to basically bust, you know, um, bust a tech company or internet company. How do you prove a lot of the stuff? It's everything's you have to prove all like the KPIs are you know fraudulent or not right, and um, downloads all these things, right? So it's a lot harder. So that, that was to our favor, where we could easily, you know, you can go film a, a, um, a facility and we'll count, count trucks. Um, you can go to the facility and see no one's in the facility; they got no products. So it was a lot easier at that time, and eventually, you know, it, it was it was easier for regulators to I think to like say, okay, this is fraudulent, and yeah. without them being in a situation like, like a legal problem, right, of, of holding a company that was real, in their in their mind maybe. Um, so um, that's so you know we, I took reasonable risk, and it, 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 it was it was well, and then at some point, and once you got rid of all that low hanging, really one hundred percent fraud, right, which was ninety percent of the market. Now you start getting into the okay. Well, you're they're frauds, but maybe not, you know, maybe not a eighty, maybe not a hundred percent, maybe they're fifty percent. 
now it becomes a lot harder to, to fight those battles, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and for the market to care and regulators to, to step in. Uh, and um, I decided some of this wasn't, it just wasn't working for me anymore. It wasn't even fun for me anymore. Because yeah, yeah. When you start short selling, when is one thing is about short selling, okay, you know, watching the tape and shorting, right, or shorting, you know, a crappy company. But there's another kind of way when you're actually looking at a company to short it, to like find bad things about it, you to do a, 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 a ton of research. For, for me, it was just affecting my psyche too much in a negative way. Yeah. Um, and then hurting my ability to find long companies because I go, well, like, if you find one negative thing now, is, is it a fraud, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I had to get back. I wanted to get out of that element. And um, it just wasn't the best, like, I thought, like, um, path for me psychologically to keep on going that way. And it, gotcha. wasn't really, it wasn't really why I found a geo. I mean, geo was, you know, we founded it to basically uh, to bring great, um, small cap companies to invest in long term and show how show our membership base how we do that and how we find these companies. So so these days, um, okay. So you mentioned OTC stocks in the last podcast. So are you are you focused on listed or Nasdaq or or um? Yeah. Yeah. You... So basically, I'm still I'm, I was still looking at OTC stuff, you know. Um, but right now with my big cap micro cap theme, I was telling you about most of those, you know, that we're finding that are going to be listed. Uh, and um, I find find this, we still find some great value on OTC, but the environment has been just obliterate. I mean, it's, just, it's so tough right now in that in that area uh, to get to get volume in those stocks. Um, but it's still I still look for value there all the time. But most of my money is going towards these beer, you know, these other other companies we talked about. Now I was, I was actually today I was I'm writing a an email to my uh, to our um, to people on our email list. We have an email list. To tell them about this whole theme I'm telling you about the big cap micro. So we're, we're using one of our stocks as a case study. Um, and it's um ran worldwide, RWWI. You know, if you look at this, this is this is a perfect example of a, a big cap micro cap. Uh, RWI is a software company um, that basically resells um, uh, engineering software, architecture software for Autodesk, basically. And the leader in that, we wrote it up in two, uh, 2019 for our members, I think around three or four dollars. The stock is 25 bucks now. Now, this is like a, a company that had a, over 100 million in revenue, a ton of employees sitting on the OTC, right? As a, as a, as a smaller cap company and never returned my calls, never talked to management, but we still, we still bought it anyway and did a lot of research about it. And it just shows like even on the OTC, you have these great big cap, layer cap themes too. Not all these, not all nano caps are my, are nano cracks, right? That's one of the things we say over here a lot. And, there's real companies in that area. And I think the last count we did, maybe it was about maybe a couple thousand stocks that kind of fit that mold for us that we look at in that area. Um, so, um, yeah, I really encourage it to be an area of focus. But OTC, wow. yeah, I will look at it. But you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm a little more careful taking a big position in OTC stock right now, only because if, you know, I don't, I don't have really an opinion on the, on the economy or where we're going recession, but if we are stuck in a recession and I, and I got to get out of a company, um, it might be tougher on OTC if, if they're going to like get affected by, by a recession, for example. Liquidity might not be there. So these are like diamonds in the rough. So like why why is their price or their stock sold down if they're a real company? They got so many employees. It's just something I've always wondered because I, I hardly I, I, I haven't done it. Um but it, you know, it makes sense. But so, when do they take off? It's just sitting there, and then one day, all of a sudden, it, it just uh... right. Well, the case of RWWI was really good. So we 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 like to look for um um we when we found RWWI, it was growing its revenue, but its earnings its earnings per share net income weren't consistently explosive. It would make some money, lose some money, or be around break even. So it wasn't really undervalued if you look at their earnings per share and like PE ratios and like that. But what we do at Geo, we try and find. Uh, we have like a a uh, a nine or ten point multi bagger list checklist, and we we try and find out that the country we're looking at meet those. And if they do meet them, where are they in terms of inflection point of that thing catalyzing? Right. So regarding RWI, uh, which we talked, which we're writing about in today's email, is that um, we're looking for that one. What's that one fact? That one thing. It might be a bunch of bullish currents. But that one really 
bullish current that stands out as the thing that's going to give us kind of that this is on the cusp of an inflection point or, or, or a multi-period, multi-bagger move, right? And they don't always exist. You know, you, you might not you might not have it exist, but RWI was operating leverage. So we noticed was an operating leverage is when you have your, um, you know, the relation between net income growth and revenue growth. So positive operating leverage would be, for example, if you um, revenues grow 20% and your earnings per share grow 50%. So your earnings start growing faster than revenue. And we we identified a trend by breaking down the numbers on a quarterly basis for several quarters that we found wait, that, that we we saw operating leverage starting to kind of kick in in the company. And that even though the, the stock looked undervalued, I mean, overvalued based on the earnings, we forecasted that it's at the current prices and at the current and the future earnings we saw coming, that is extremely undervalued. And once that would happen and the market would see that, they would move it up. So that's what happened there. That was basically finding that inflection point of growth uh, in, in earnings per share due to operating leverage. Um, and, and that's what set that one off. So you're basically, you know, so I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, am I looking, I'm, I'm more by this time, at this point in my career, I'm looking for more of those setups. I mean, I am a long-term investor. I've always been a kind of really a fan of trying to find, if I can, if I can find a stock in the meat of a growth cycle, that's just going to start. That's when you can capture a lot of the multi buyer gain. So, you know, if you invested in a stock for 20 years, for example, there might be different multi bagger moves in those in, yeah. that, in that chart, right? And someone may come down for a while. You can choose the whole throughout the whole multi bagger move if you're if you're lucky enough to figure that out, right? Or you maybe pick pockets of it. And um, that's part of my strategy too, is doing that with my portfolio. Gotcha. So, um, what what's your time frame for holding more or less? What, what's what's your goals? Yeah, uh, that's, that's that's moving target, man. It's like it depends what the reason is and and and, and the, what I'm looking at, right? So, uh, let's talk about that meet the meet the meet of growth cycle. Uh, I'm I basically define my I define short term targets based on what I think a stock should be worth maybe right now or within twelve months, and then I ask myself, okay, beyond that, is there a multi bagger move beyond that that that, that I want to carry through? And then around that, I'll define my sell strategies, right? So I might say, at a, at, at this price target, I want to be out of eighty percent of my position and I'll hold the rest long term. Or I might even say, I'm just going to hold it the whole way through. It's just it's, it's a case by case story. But I think the best, I mean, the, the most prudent way to do it. And if you look at what's happened now with with um, this this big pullback in the market, some stocks I didn't really sell much of have done crazy round trips, right? So you had this. Six seven years of gains get a lot of it getting eradicated. So that's the, that's the risk of doing of doing that. Um, I when I was early in my career, for the first twenty years, my strategy was quite simple and it worked really really good. Um, the, the gains were pretty were, were pretty incredible. Um, where I would basically find a pocket of growth where I thought the stock was going to grow, the company was going to have growth in earnings, sales and earnings, for at least maybe five or six quarters. I, we call that now a geo, the geo power ranking. So how many consecutive quarters in a row can a company grow its revenue by maybe 15% and earnings by at least 30, 40%. And then, okay, given you found that is a stock undervalued based on your valuation ratios. If it is, you know, we will we, we'll, we'll buy the stock, you know, um, during the, hopefully during that period and the stock will hopefully get to a, a, a short-term valuation based on that growth cycle. And it worked like a charm. Um, it didn't work. That that strategy didn't work. The last fifteen year bull market because the whole growth plus value thing wasn't really working for us. Really, the, 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 uh, the GARP. But now I think that's back again. So if you're asking like right now, I'm going to do my combination is going to be looking for these multi bagger moves, you know, long term setups. But in the short run, trying to find these GPR type of setups where I'm, I'm combining momentum, looking at stocks, you know, doing well, you know, maybe on a new high list, plus these uh, really high GPR that are based by fundamentals. Uh, and growth. That's how I'm kind of um, looking at my short-term stuff. And then the other short-term thing we do is uh, we call it informational arbitrage. We try and find stocks in nano cap land where there's information disconnect. And we do that usually around earnings time. Um, so four times a year um, when the smaller caps re release their earnings, um, we can, we like to, you know, find, find something we like in the, that had great earnings during the press releases, right? And then go compare that, uh, go look at conference call transcripts. And if we find some either bearish or bullish information in the transcript that's not in the press release, we can maybe formulate a trade around that because 
a lot of times the nano cap companies aren't well followed. So the information isn't quickly digested yet. So we can be early in that digestion of information. Um, so and we might only do one or two a, a quarter, right? You know, the last one, we, we on the third quarter, we had one on a CECO. It was like a 40% move for us in, in a day and a half because of something like that. So the stock had great earnings. Um, and the stock opened in the, uh, on 12 bucks. They beat estimates. And all of a sudden, the stock went from 12 bucks to 850. And uh, we went in the conference call. We were actually on a live. I was on a live actually and said, hey, you know, we got to make a move over here. And, and we bought some around 970 or so. And sold it at 12 bucks, you know, a, a day later or something, or a day and a half later. I, I think I also had some of the options to do or something. Um, so that that's how that we just basically, I like, I like to, you know, and it's not, you know, I, I've never been a technical guy in terms of reading charts. So I try and do it like, Using the fundamentals uh, and information disconnects. It's scary though, because you just you don't know what what are you missing sometimes. So that's so how, how much. Here, 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 yeah, here's a great one, Dave. This is gonna, this is this is a, this is just an awesome one here. This, this this basically defines information arbitrage and why every retail investor, even if you're a trader, man, right, should explore information arbitrage in your in your research bucket. And here, this is this is the example. There was there's a company called Smart Employee Benefits. The symbol on the OTC was SEBFF, I think, or SEBD, if I forgot, and SEB.V in Canada. So we had bought the stock, you know, a couple of years ago, and um, it didn't do so well for us because um, they had a bad capital structure. Um, so we were just sitting around waiting for, you know, for the for to to, to um, for that to rectify, and it really wasn't happening. And then we got into this really bad 2022 environment, right? Well. The stock was sitting at um, maybe 10 cents or so um, and, and maybe August or so of 2022. And the company reported, I think it was their second quarter earnings and another disappointment in earnings. It, wouldn't, it, it didn't come through. Um, and I was on the conference call. And on the conference call, basically, you know, people are asking them questions about why aren't you buying back stock? Happy we haven't done a reverse stock or uplift it yet, you know, and all this wonderful stuff. And he's like, I can't comment. You know, I was like, okay. He was repeatedly asked this question, and basically he basically started saying, basically, well, we're looking at a significant a significant transaction. Okay. Uh, and then basically he went into basically a kind of a monologue on why they shouldn't be public. Why there should be more acquisitions in the space? Why companies their size shouldn't be that should, basically should be acquired? So like that was just like wow. He's basically telling us. I mean, something's here. Either you know, it's either a contract, uh, a joint venture, or or a sale, right? That someone's going to buy him. And just the somberness, of the, the way the call was, it just, it, it just seemed to me that the only way he thought he could survive was a a um, getting selling the company. They didn't have any money to buy a company. Um, I, I don't think he was going to be that. The contract wasn't transactional, really, as a situation. And that doesn't match that term, right? So we figured, okay, worst case, it's a, it's a joint venture. That's pretty interesting. Obviously, pretty substantial. Best case, it gets acquired. So that was August, okay? We we, we reported to our June investing members. The stock maybe popped maybe 12, 13 cents, for, you know, and it stayed there. Basically, stayed there. And lo and behold, beginning of this year in January, they announced a uh, they got acquired uh, like 20, 22, 23 cents. So a big and the stock went from like wow. 13 to 20 cents. That's information arbitrage. And that you you know you can't get that anywhere else in the big cap company. That stock would have reflected that that's comments with CEO immediately. And I and I, and it's like it might not be fancy, it might not be smart, it might not be okay, oh, okay, you know, Ivy League, right? Like a lot of times I'll talk about it to a, you know, a, 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 an analyst. Oh, my God, well, that's, that's not smart enough for me. <laughs> well, it's want to make money, right? And that kind of like kind of um, avoidance of a, a strategy like this makes it even more lucrative because the people ignore it, right? And it takes, it does take work. You have to actually read the filings and do that and, 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 uh, and do that. And sometimes People never find the they don't find the information that you found. Like for that one, it took six months, right? Yeah. You're sitting and doubting yourself the whole time. But that's just a great example of uh, information arbitrage. Information arbitrage, yeah. Um, I have a friend. He he uh, he has a hedge fund, and he um 
he started well he's very good with filings and data and he just loves that stuff and he used to go short now he's doing that and he would um he he does even now like in this kind of market get stocks like that are under the 10 cent rule there's a nasdaq dime rule 10 cent right. rule that, and he'll he'll invest you know like investigate in his own way like hit up the investors relations the talk to people in the company and try to get information to see if this if if they're aware that it's uh the 10 cent rule is applying because sometimes these companies don't even know and then the they'll jump on the boat and start like realizing, Oh, we don't want to get delisted. And then they'll make an effort, but it's a real company. They have like all these employees and, and, you know, maybe the, the CEO, I remember one, I forgot the ticker, the CEO resigned and it was a whole new group of people and they didn't know what they were doing. So he, he, he had to like guide them through it or something, you know? Uh, and, and yeah, so he, he had all that information and the company, the new interim CEO didn't even know. So, oh, wow. he, you know, so like he, he has the information and information arbitrage, I guess, in a way. And then not now, like he ha he, he knows more about the stock than the, than the company does the new the new right. regime or whatever. So, and it, you know, so he found a lot of edge in that. And that's, uh, and the stock is so low that like, where else can it go? It can either go, I mean, it can go to OTC land, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, uh, I'm glad you're connecting with him. Yeah, yeah. I, I will. I will. I will. It's uh, awesome. So, Maj, man, um, what about to so start to wrap it up? So, what about your your uh, most memorable trade? I mean, that that's that, that's a, that was a, that's a good that what I described was pretty interesting, right? Because of, because of what it what it did, you know, my um, you know, there's, there's a lot of short short selling ones, right? And one of my favorites was uh, when uh, this chicken farmer. Uh, com uh, company in China. Uh, what was the symbol? Oh, oh the one man. with the the one in the China hustle. Yeah, Yui, Yui, Yui. Yeah, uh, he, he, so they put the chicken farmer in a suit and made him the CEO or something like. Oh, that's that's a different one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> this, this, this is a this although this guy probably could insert CEO, insert any CEO in there, right? But uh, yeah, the symbol was Y U I I. It was Yuhei, I think. You uh, and um, and we were actually bullish on this company originally. We had we found a Chinese company that's actually good, right? And we were thinking about you know I actually was had a position in the stock and it was long. The initial impression from my underground investigator was yeah this might be um, a good company actually because we kind of verified some of their financials through the documents in China that you can get your hands on and compare them to the SEC filings. Um, and this is a lesson, like the lesson in terms of the, what these, what some of these companies they might have come to America as legitimate, but left as frauds. You know, you like you use that legitimacy to to, to raise their yeah. money and be a problem. So in this case, uh, I just wanted to basically you know send my guys in China to to, to basically visit the chicken farms. And the stock I think was maybe 10, 12, 13, 14 bucks at the time, and um, they just raised some money to buy another chicken farm. So we wanted to basically verify that this they actually acquired this other chicken farm. So on uh, one of my investigators was in China on the way to the farm, right? He was actually going to go to Yui's farm uh, that they already owned. He's telling the taxi guy what he's doing, right? He goes, "Oh no, my my uh, my uh, I don't know if it was a relative. I'm 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 going out with the girl who actually." Um, he's the daughter. She's the daughter of the father, uh, or the guy who Yui claims they bought the farm from. And he, they didn't sell it. <laughs> so in the cab, that's so serendipitous, right? So basically, wow. Then we find like, you know U turn. <laughs> we're, going, we're going there instead, right? Yeah. So we go. We, 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 the taxi guy takes him there, and he finds out that no, this was never a transaction that took place as it was disclosed in the U.S. Um, so the money, uh, the fifteen or twenty million dollars they raised. They didn't go to purchase any, any farms at all. Wow. And we had recordings with that individual, the real owner of the farm, saying, no, these, you know, Yui is going to go, is going to go bankrupt. They're almost, they're almost losing money. And he basically um, told me uh, that uh, just do this little scam and we won't tell anybody, we'll split the money. You know, and wow. so that's, and, and, you know, was, and, we got to a point where I, as, as so then we're like, oh, we're going to go short this now, but, you know, we went short. So I read a report on it, 
and this is how crazy things got too, was like in the filings, the SEC filings, there was a spot where it said um, under risk factors where the CEO sometimes co-mingles the company's money with his own bank account. Like oh, what, what yeah. auditor passes that? that yeah, thing? yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so it made all sense. And then, you know, it, it all culminated in the stock was like one, it, it, you know, we were battling back and forth for a week or so, right? You know, um, getting recordings back and forth because, you know, the UE CEO would basically counter us and they're not telling the truth. And we, go, we would go back and inter- interview the other guy and get a recording now. He's what I was talking about, right? I don't want any trouble with US regulators. So um, it got to the point where the stock, I remember, was, it was, it was, I think it was a Friday morning. The stock was 150. And Yui was been, was holding uh, holding a conference call, the dollar fifty, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A dollar um to, to address things, and it was like nine o'clock in the morning, nine ten in the morning. Well, calls going on, just starting, and that whole issue of commingling money came up, right? By by one of our guys that asked the question on the call, and they're having a dialogue in Chinese and Mandarin, the company, right? And of course, we have people on the on the call who speak Mandarin. <laughs> yeah. And basically saying, "No, you can't say that. You can't disclose that. You're gonna, you you shouldn't say that kind of stuff, right?" And they're saying it, and then I think we know nothing. We know what's going on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stock yeah. <laughs> got halted, done, and everything, and then got delisted, you know, to, to to zero. Wow. So that was a, That's an interesting China hustle, you know, trade. Yeah. You know, on, on the long side, my most memorable kind of investment uh, was basically um, uh, stock. Symbol right now is KRMD. Um, it's called or uh, Karuma. Oh, is, is, is that you know what? It's been a minute. Let me see if it's actually still the one, right? Yeah, yeah, KRMD. Um, I forgot the old symbol already, what it was <laughs> Reaper, R E P R, the Grim Reaper. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, I had it like an eight cents or so and held it for 15 years or something or some kind of crazy number. And it eventually got to like you know, sixteen bucks, but it, it took that long to get there, and that was you know, or maybe I'm sorry, twelve, maybe twelve fifty or something. So you and, you you held the whole way through, or did it have a massive uh, gap up or something? And that was it was a whole through. Actually, I got really lucky that during COVID is when it actually right March around that time it just took off, uh, and I just I, I got really lucky that it did. You wow. Know, it was not- it was in the home healthcare business. My target was three or four dollars, and I was. This is where my greed got. You know, usually when I'm greedy, I get I get really my, my ass handed to me because I wait too long. Yeah. When I got to my price target, at first it was one fifty. Yeah, I'll wait till three. You know, I'll keep using our. Yeah, I'll wait a little longer, and I, I got lucky that I waited. <laughs> wait, so you held, but you waited fifteen years. You said right? Yeah, I, I bought it in probably in uh, 07, 08. So it was maybe thirty. So how how do you have how do you hold it that long and with those targets changing? Yeah, well, basically, you know, in the beginning, I, I I it was a small position, right? So I didn't care about it really. It was one of those things where I mean, it's a home health care company. They make a home health home health care medical device uh, to infuse medication into your into your um, body through a subcutaneous needle. So that so basically in the skin, right? Absorbed by the skin as opposed to into the vein. So it's a great home healthcare device. Uh, they make the pump that doesn't work on it doesn't work on electricity. It just works on the leverage and stuff. So it was really convenient. So I if I liked what they did, and at that time they had um you know some decent revenue, a couple million bucks maybe if I remember correctly. And there was a change in the in, in, in the in the reimbursement rates of insurance that basically were going to basically allow them to get more drugs um infused through their system so that was why that was the theory that i'll wait on it they weren't they were they weren't making any money but they weren't losing money right around breaking even a lot of recurring revenue which is a theme i like uh because the needles you got to buy the needles you know every um every so often um so yeah i mean i just i just at that time this is one of those examples you know they were i was valuing a company okay because of its model on revenues not earnings so that's why i kept it but I started out as a small position. It was never a big position, so I never worried about it. When it got to four, two, four, three, four dollars, I was like, okay. And the reason I kind of kept it longer than I probably um, normally would have was there was an active as buying a lot of stock the whole time. Ah, uh, you know, yeah. Was like, okay, and I met the guy, and I, I really liked him. And um, I believe they had a they had even though it met my it, it, it reached my price targets uh, those shorter term ones. They were the market leader and hadn't really captured a lot of the market they could capture. 
So if you extrapolate it out, Pat, you know, towards what they could get to, it could be a lot higher stock. Ah, uh, okay. And, yeah, uh, yeah, it makes sense. Wow, man. Well, well, that was a big win. Yeah, but yeah, it was a long time. I mean, a, a yeah. lot of the movement happened, like, to uh, be honest with you, I mean, it went from, like, you know, eight, to, you know, 10 to 40 cents and sat there, you know. But really, it was from 2014, it was 40 cents, but the, the, the big move happened, like, in two years. It was like I had to hold that long, you know, but but it happened like that, that last big move was like a year and a half, two years. So in retrospect, would I have been better off waiting and buying at a 40 cents, you know, if I, <laughs> uh, you know, for time value of money? I don't know. But it, it ended up being, um, you know, a lot of was, I was lucky there, too, that that, that, that that happened. But that was a memorable one. Um, you know, this, so there's been a lot, you know, a lot of memorable trades that I've done. Um but that's but those those two are pretty interesting. Well, one from the short side, one from the long side. Both yeah. super interesting, man. Nice. Um, all right, Maj. So, like, where where can people find you? And uh, yeah, and you I know, can get you, you, you come to geobesting dot com. Maybe you can opt in. You can be on our email list there if you want. Um, uh, if anybody who mentions your you know, you know your show, your name, well, I'll, I'll give them a discount too. Um, so just awesome. to, to send me an email and say hey, I mentioned Dave's show. And, We'll do that. Um, on Twitter, you can follow me at Maj Geo Investing. You can follow Geo Investing and at Geo Investing. And we, we do a lot of case studies and educational content uh, on, on those um, social media handles. Awesome. Well, Maj, man, it's great to connect once again. And yeah, we'll we'll keep in touch and we'll have, you know, we'll do another one in the future. No, we'll love it. Thanks, David, man, for doing this again. I really appreciate it. Awesome, man. You, you, you got to come on my show sometime. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, we'll do. We'll keep it. We'll talk afterwards. Well, thanks right. much. Have a good weekend. You too, bud. See you. Bye.